Every so often you'll be going about your day, minding your business, and then... Don't forget a resurrecting Russia. A Russian invasion of Ukraine. Crisis in Ukraine. How close are we really to war? It's Russia. Russia. And Russia. Russia. Anything involving Russia, the United States, and NATO tends to have all the characteristics of a 21st century crisis. Meme wars initiated by official government accounts? Check. Shallow mainstream media analysis? The only clarity we've had in this whole thing is that American citizens are on their own uh, in, a, in a potential war zone. Check. Articles telling you which weapons manufacturers stock to buy because, hey, war might break out and thousands of people might die, but at least your portfolio can grow. Yeah, we're not surprised either. Check. But why is there tension? What's the missing piece the mainstream news isn't covering very well? Are Western countries correct in saying that Vladimir Putin is a relentless aggressor trying to invade neighboring countries and dreaming of resurrecting the Soviet Union? Or is Russia justified in saying that the United States and its allies are hostile, breaking promises, and deliberately encircling Russia? This is a story about war, loss, betrayal, and at the center of it all, the largest military alliance in the world. The coverage of this crisis tends to downplay the role of one central player, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, also known as NATO. If the North Atlantic Treaty Organization had stuck with providing basic security against Russia or anyone else for its original membership uh, of um, the West European countries, we would have no crisis today. Unpacking NATO is key to understanding Russia's actions. You see, NATO was born right after World War II as an alliance against the Soviet Union, its growing influence, and its massive army. In the West, it's often forgotten that it was the Soviet Union that made the biggest contribution in defeating Nazi Germany. Around 27 million Soviets died in the Second World War. This almost unimaginable death toll is crucial to understanding why the formation of NATO made Russians feel like the world betrayed them. We'll get to that in a bit, but first, a little more about NATO. The NATO treaty has a section, Article 5, that says that an attack on one member country should be seen as an attack on all, which is a useful deterrent if you're worried about being invaded by the Soviet Union. Now, the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991 without Article 5 ever being invoked by any of NATO's 16 member countries. But since the Soviet Union ended, this historically anti-Soviet alliance has doubled to 30 members. Three decades on, that includes some countries that were part of the Soviet Union and others right on Russia's border. Understandably, some of those Eastern European countries had brutal experiences living under Soviet domination and the fear of Soviet tanks rolling across the border. Joining NATO and keeping it alive was seen as a good buffer against repeating that history. So they mobilized um ethnic lobbies and um, in, in America in particular to agitate, to press for the expansion of NATO to their countries. But the United States, as the biggest member and the primary weapons systems provider in the alliance, also has its reasons for growing NATO. During the Cold War, you know, NATO existed to defend Western Europe against the Soviet Union. Uh, and of course, the Soviet Union never attacked Na uh, Western Europe, so NATO never had to fight. Now, after the end of the Cold War, unfortunately, what you got was very much just as a, a desperate way of finding a new reason for NATO to exist when its actual reason to exist had vanished. Um, you got this phrase, out of area or out of mission. And then NATO began to cast around for um, places to do things. This was also a way, of course, of pleasing the Americans in order to keep the Americans in Europe. Remember a little earlier we talked about Russia's sense of betrayal? Well, this is where it comes from. As early as 1990, US diplomats reportedly promised not one inch eastward of NATO expansion. But this promise was actually never written down. So the US says there was no formal agreement. Russia insists that there was a verbal agreement and that it believed the US. And it's not like NATO wasn't aware of what growing the alliance could mean. Boris Yeltsin, Russia's first post-Soviet president, warned even back then that any expansion would trigger, quote, the flames of war bursting across the whole of Europe, 
Well, we know what happened next. Well, NATO has expanded to take in former communist states of Eastern Europe um, and three former Soviet republics of Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania. In 2007, the United States and a couple of other NATO countries pressed for NATO membership for Ukraine and Georgia as well. This belief that the Russians have, that they were tricked after the fall of the Soviet Union, is where that sense of betrayal comes from. Now, whether it's justified or not is a matter of opinion. But what does matter is that this is a big reason why relations between Russia and the West are the way they are, and why there's so much mistrust between them. So, Ukraine. As Anatol mentioned, the US and some other NATO countries wanted Ukraine to join in 2007. That probably played a part in Russia deciding to invade and annex Crimea in 2014. Quick refresher, Crimea, back then, was a part of Ukraine, though historically it had been a part of Russia. Today, the status of Crimea is complicated. Some nations recognize Russia's annexation, while others, like the United States, do not. Historically, Russia does have connections to that region. But more importantly, it has a major naval base there. Well, obviously, if Ukraine is in NATO and Crimea is part of Ukraine, you know, NATO is not going to tolerate a, a Russian naval base on NATO territory. Sooner or later, NATO was going to say to Russia, get out. Uh, well, uh, as many Russians have said to me, we didn't lose 500,000 men in Crimea in the Second World War, you know, to be expelled by you lot. Now, since the invasion of Crimea, the US has gotten further involved in Ukraine providing about 90% of the country's military aid. And that's not lost on Russia's leadership. Well, from a strategic point of view, it means exactly that. It means what it would mean to America if Mexico tried to join a Chinese-led military alliance. But while that analogy makes sense, Russia has continued to interfere in Ukraine. Other than actually occupying and annexing part of the country, Russia has also supported pro-Russia separatists and launched cyber attacks. There's a lot to the argument that Russia just doesn't respect Ukraine's sovereignty, especially when President Putin has already said on record, quote, I believe that Russians and Ukrainians are one people, one nation, in fact. So is Ukraine actually going to join NATO, putting more of Russia's border up against the hostile alliance? Well, probably not. No, I mean, there's no chance of Ukraine ever becoming a NATO member. In fact, NATO members are not prepared to guarantee Ukraine's defense. So in one way, all of this is an argument about nothing. Joining NATO isn't like signing up for Netflix. Name, email, credit card info, and you're good to go. In order for a new member to join, all the current members have to approve. The reason why Ukraine and Georgia didn't join after the US wanted them to is that France and Germany said no. NATO rules also require a country to not have any contested borders or territorial disputes before joining. Well, part of Ukraine has already been annexed by Russia and Russian-backed separatists are fighting for control of other territories. So if all this is an argument about nothing, then why all the huffing and puffing from Putin? From Russia's point of view, having Ukraine as an American ally without being in NATO is just as bad as having Ukraine in NATO. As long as there's a tug of war over Ukraine and deep mistrust between Russia, the US and NATO, there will always be a chance for war to break out. What you must not do in a deeply divided country is face it with a clear and unavoidable choice between Russia and the West. A neutrality, in my view, is an entirely feasible solution, and one which, by the way, does not prevent Ukraine from um, developing as a, a, a free market democracy. The problem is, the Biden administration is so scared of its domestic opposition, not just the Republicans, but also within the Democratic Party, that this obvious compromise solution and you know, peaceful settlement uh, are not possible for the West, but that is a, a profound tragedy.